Hi, everyone, and welcome to ABC's of Anesthesia. And today is a special live episode with Rao. Now, Rao, you're from New Zealand, right? And you've just yes. done part two Viva Bootcamp course, and now you're in the hot seat to be Viva live on this channel. Hey guys. Yes, yeah. Yeah, very nervous, but good. Thank you. That's uh, right. And hey, ner nerves are okay because we're about, you know, just keeping on improving and getting better and all that kind of stuff. And t t tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you in your journey of, uh, you know, anesthetic training and what have the challenges been? Yeah, so I'm in my uh, sort of final uh, ATY2 at the moment. Uh, so I've just done the written exam, waiting to hear back. Um, uh, outside of work, I'm a dad of two boys, uh, three-year-old and two-year-old, and that keeps me fairly busy the rest of the time. Wow, that's, that sounds great. <laughs> um, I was just saying, I, I didn't have, you know, I, I don't have kids, and I can't imagine how challenging it is to balance all the other priorities of kids that, you know, they take a lot of your time and study for this. Do you have any particular tips for everyone out there who has these other com competing priorities? Um, I think for me is... Um, I think getting up early before the kids wake up, that's, that's often quite useful. Mm. Um, and fortunately, you know, my wife's really supportive. She's medical as well. So she kind of understands the process. Uh, sure. So yeah, there's a lot of payback to do. <laughs> that's yeah. so true. So um, what, what have you got planned after, after all of this finishes? How are you going to celebrate? I think just, I think just family time, eh? just, um, you know, solid, solid, a couple of weeks of, uh, spending time with family maybe we we'll go out to have some barbecues go see my parents oh, that's um nice. yeah looking forward to that i wish i wish i could do that right now that'd, that'd be great <laughs> um, well, well look let's get let's get started so i'll start the time let's say we'll do a, a minute on the stem just so you can kind right. of have, have a think about it and again yep. we'll go through and if there's something worth discussing We'll make this really you know kind of pleasant where we go oh yeah yep. is that what you think let's have a chat about it so we won't make it a full-on hardcore viva just for learning okay uh ben i'll read out the stem but i'll i'll start the timer now and i'll read out the stem uh so for everyone uh, listening and watching a 70 year old man for a total knee replacement he suffered a stroke two months ago his past history is notable for hypertension hyperlipidemia rheumatoid arthritis and atrial fibrillation Medication he's on is warfarin, a statin, amlodipine, and methotrexate. Also ibuprofen and paracetamol, PRN, um, as well as aspirin occasionally. He's worried about perioperative stroke. How do you counsel him? Yes, just take a minute and have a think. Now that's a minute. And, I, and I'm also mm. going to put in the disclaimer just as a matter of formality. This is obviously just really general medical advice for exam preparation. And, you know, please don't use this information to treat any specific patients. Make sure you, you know, consult your treating team and your supervisor and you know, consider the patient's unique circumstances. So after that, uh, what do you reckon? How do you counsel this patient? Yeah, so this is a 70-year-old gentleman who's uh, got quite a few comorbidities and understandably he's uh, at risk of having perioperative strokes and he is worried about it. Um, the way I would approach this in counseling would be talking about the risks, the benefit and the alternative. But overall, I think um, given this is an elective procedure I'd, and he is at risk of a significant perioperative um, stroke, we would ideally delay this, uh, ideally six months. Uh, if not nine months later, if possible. Yeah, okay. And what makes you say six to nine months? So uh, the evidence is um, limited. Um, I think from reading previously, the SNAP guidelines is, uh, you know, ideally at least a month. But then there's other papers later on that sort of suggest uh, at least six months. And I've seen other articles um, to suggest nine months later on to minimize the risk of periodic stroke. Mm -hmm. And we know he's got, based on a Ched Vass score, he's already got a few um, sort of risk factors, but moderate risk, but not high risk. The real worrying thing here is that he's had a very recent stroke two months ago. Mm. And what would you put his risk at of perioperative stroke? Can you quantify this at all? Um, so based on the history, he's got a um, Ched Vass score of four. Um, and that's about 4% annually. Now, that is given the fact that if he, if he hasn't had a recent stroke, just but because he's had a very recent stroke, that risk is, is increased. 
And do you have a, do you have any kind of idea of say we did the operation now two months after the stroke versus waiting mm -hmm. nine months? What kind of increased risk does that pose? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but I think it would it would increase it because of the how, how recent that stroke is. Okay. What are the other risk factors for stroke? Uh, so and his so and. Oh. And so in, in general, perioperative, perioperative stroke. So risk factors for perioperative stroke. Uh, so having congestive heart failure, he's already got hypertension. Um, age greater than sixty-five gives you a point, but age greater than seventy-five would increase that um, as well. Um, having diabetes, um, having any vascular pathy, um, being a male, uh, and of course having stroke in the past. Mm -hmm. Any other perioperative factors that would increase the risk of stroke? Um, atrial fibrillation in, in his case as yeah. well, yeah. And it's, it's one of those things, so the risk factor question, you know, there's so many risk factors out there, right? So yeah. you get, it's such a broad question. And I think you kind of went through some of the Chad Vask items, didn't you? Mm. Which yes. is great. So you've got a method. Now let's say that you went even broader. How would you think about even broader than Chad Vask? Um, so I guess... We could think about if you know he's he's uh, uh, pro he's got a coagulopathy if he's prothrombotic, mm -hmm. he's more likely to generate a clot, uh, and that will increase their susceptibility as well. And what kind of surgeries then would cause an increased risk of stroke? Right. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so surgeries like endarectomy uh, would significantly increase that risk mm -hmm. of stroke. Beautiful. Any any other surgeries, just broadly speaking? Um, I guess any surgery that predisposes someone to significant high pole tension mm -hmm. um, with large hemodynamic changes would increase your risk of stroke, any mm -hmm. major surgeries. Now with that answer, so I actually really like that you, you went for the money, which was Chad Vask, and then the next step would be to go, well, there's patient and surgical factors and maybe anesthetic factors, but these are the kind of important things, Chad Vask and maybe mentioned carotid endocrine is that that's obviously as you mentioned the yes. hybrid one so he does reveal about so as you do your assessment he does reveal that he had the stroke two months ago and now he has mm -hmm. mild residual weakness of the left hand uh, he's got the atrial fibrillation on warfarin and so mm -hmm. you like and he's he's very motivated to uh, proceed with his operation because he's got so much pain what do you yeah. do do you delay the surgery or do you crack on I think in this case is a risk benefit analysis. So I would outline the potential risks and, um, you know, um, weigh it against the, you know, his need for surgery and what it means to him to delay it. And what is the, you know, what does it mean for him to have a stroke and, and what is that effect on his quality of life? And ultimately, um, you know, if he's fully informed, it's up to him to make that ultimate decision. Mm -hmm. But so, uh, and where would you err on the side of? Uh, I would still err on the side of delaying if possible okay. because it's an elective procedure. Sounds good. Now he presents seven months later. So now it's nine months later, as you recommended to the pre-admission clinic. Um, and you notice that he's on all these medications that, that you've got listed, warfarin, estatin, and lodipine methotrexate, and then mm -hmm. paracetamol, PRN, as well as the aspirin. What do you do about those medications? Um, so I would take a history of the dose, ask them if, they, uh, if there's been any changes. Specifically, I want to know, you know, he he's, has a few things with significant side effects that can affect my um, in the surgery. So methotrexate, um, has he, how long he's been on that? What sort of side effect he gets from that? Um, does he have any hepatic impairment from that? He's on um, two things that um, are antiplatelets, is uh, aspirin and ibuprofen. So, you know, is he normally uh, quite likely to bleed as well? Um, in terms of, of course, he's on anticoagulant uh, warfarin. Um, warfarin, I would actually ask him to stop five days prior to the surgery to minimize the risk of the uh, bleeding for the surgery based on the bridge trial yeah. recommendations. Uh, so five days before you'd cease it, so you wouldn't bridge with Clexane or anything like that? No, so he's got a Chad Vest, based on that information, he's got a Chad Vest score of four. So um, the current recommendation is if you, if you get a, a Chad Vest score of seven, eight, or nine, uh, then you would consider bleeding, uh, bridging. But otherwise, there, there's a significant risk of um, bleeding and without um, significant increase in risk of stroke. 
given that Chadvar score. If he was on a newer agent like a DOAC, such as Dabiatrin, what would you do? Hmm. Um, so that's kind of controversial. The, the latest evidence is the pause trial, which just says to stop it uh, two, two days prior and including the day of surgery and add one more day if he has any renal impairment. And he could have given he's on uh, ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. Do you know any, how, how would you calculate his risk of bleeding? Uh, has bleed is, uh, is a way to calculate it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, so several factors, I, ca I can't remember all of it, but the, but the main things are um, if he has hypertension, uh, if he has alcohol use, if he, if he has labor INR whilst on warfarin, um, if he has any significant hepatic uh, or renal dysfunction, or if he has had previously major bleeding uh, uh, issues in the past. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Actually, just, just for the audience, let's get the has blood criteria up, but I think you were very good with that. So yeah, hypertension, renal disease, liver disease, stroke history, prior major bleeding under predisposition, labile INR, age greater than 65, and medication usage predisposing to bleeding, which these patients do have, and alcohol use greater than eight drinks per week. So that's, you know, scores one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I believe. So out of, out of a... Yeah, out of a score of nine, and it increases your risk with every increasing score. Fantastic. Now, okay, so that's how you judge your risk of bleeding. And I, and I just love that you've got, you know, you've got your clotting one, you've got your bleeding one, you, you, know, you, you use them together to see where your relative risk is. And now it's not a matter of, of like opinion or gut feeling. There's some pretty decent data out there, which is great. Um, how about aspirin? He's on aspirin. Um, what do you do about that? Um, my understanding is that he can actually stop that. Um, I think he's he's not at increased risk of stroke with continuing that. He is at increased risk of bleeding. And I think there is a pre previous a trial on that. Um, uh, the names just escaped me, but I'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's really interesting. When, when that trial came out, I think everyone yeah. was kind of surprised because we had this gut feeling that we should continue yeah. the sprint. And even when you answer that question, like, I, you know, I believe we should stop it, but it, it was all like, um, but you were you're absolutely correct. So poise too. Poise sure. too, yeah. Yeah, sure. You have uh, no benefit of increasing of, of yeah. aspirin, but you do get the increased risk of bleeding, except in one group, potentially. There's a subgroup that may have benefit for continuing aspirin. Do you know what that is? Uh, is it the people with significant, uh, I'm not sure, significant ischemic heart disease or? It's ischemic, it's ischemic heart disease, but a particular intervention was performed. Oh, uh, so, so like a stint. Yeah, that's right. So in yeah. that subgroup, yeah. potentially there's benefit. But like, I think like with a lot of these subgroup analyses, you really need your mm. own, yeah, their own study. Uh, so that is good. So, yep. So you would stop aspirin. Fantastic. Now the, his GP, he, he tells you that his GP told him that he should start this medication called metoprolol to prevent stroke. Mm. Uh, what do you reckon? Um, so I think metoprolol will help with this rate control and he, by having his uh, AF rate controlled, that is good for his general health, but I'm not sure if metoprolol specifically uh, decreases your risk of stroke or not. Uh, I'm not aware it does. Um, and starting, newly starting a metoprolol in this setting would predispose him of an increased risk of stroke. Mm -hmm. What's that based on? Yeah, that's based on POISE 1. Yeah, excellent. Good, good. Now you're about to anesthetize this patient. What's your plan? What's your anesthesia plan? Let's say this patient has all the information you've just heard. Um, exercise tolerance is reasonable, even though he's got a bit of pain from it and he's ready for his total knee replacement. Uh, you've done everything that you normally do. What do you do for your anesthetic? Um, so I think I would discuss some of the options. We can go with regional um, and, and or we can go with the general anesthetic. My in his case, I would earn on the case uh, in the side of a regional for him. Mm -hmm. It would help him with a pain relief mm -hmm. uh, in the long run. So a spinal anesthetic plus maybe a, a, duct, uh, a ductal canal block as well. Mm -hmm. yep. um, good, good. So let's say uh, you, do, you do the spinal anesthetic. 
Um, what, what do you use? What, what uh, drugs do you use, solution do you use? Uh, so I use bupivacaine uh, heavy 0.5%. I give about 2.5 mils um, with uh, 100 mics of fentanyl. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, I, um, uh, 15 mics of fentanyl. Uh, and yeah, so, so that's what I give. Okay. Now the surgeons, it, it's the register operating and the surgery seems to be taking a lot longer than they would have expected. So the surgery's now gone mm. for about three hours and the patient starts complaining of pain. What do you do? So first of all, I would like to establish what the patient means by pain. So that might be discomfort, where sharp the pain, pain is, is a sharp pain, pain from the surgical. Pain. Yeah. Okay. So then the first thing is, you know, this is maybe, my, you know, this is a worrying situation. Most likely it's because the spinal is wearing off and it's taking too long. I'll firstly ask the surgeon to stop. Uh, and I will talk to the patient about com converting this into general anesthetics to facilitate with the surgery. Okay. We, and so what's your plan for the general anesthetic then? Um, so there's several concerns here for the general anesthetic. I mean, he's got a rheumatoid history of rheumatoid arthritis, um, specifically, um, hopefully in my pre-assessment, I've established if he has any sort of airway dysfunction, how his neck mobility is, if he's got any um, risk of uh, atlantoaxial um, uh, subluxation, um, if he's got any sort of lung disease or any other uh, cardiovascular disease associated with the rheumatoid arthritis. But if not, then I would use a, a Teva anesthetic, um, running a bit of metaraminol to uh, aiming for hemodynam uh, hemodynamically stable induction. And I would use LMA in this case. Right. So exactly what drugs do you give? Uh, so I give, so I start with a propofol um, Teva using the Schneider model. My aim is a CET between three to four. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, I would be running a metaraminal infusion to maintain the blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, running about five mils per hour. Now you've got a registrar with you who's managing the airway and they're unable to get the LMA in. And you find that the patient's very tight and resistive. It's, it's like they weren't given enough propofol before your registrar went in. Uh, and you're, you're having trouble ventilating the patient. What do you do? Okay, so... Um, so the first thing is, um, can I bag mask ventilate them? And if not, then I would try to put a Gadol in. Uh, is it a sorry? Uh, could I just clarify if it's a bag mask ventilation issue, or is it issue putting opening the mouth to put the LMA in? So the, your, your registrar was overly excited excited when um, they tried to put the LMA in. The LMA was attempted a little bit too light, and the patient's now clamping mm -hmm. it down. So you're not able to pass a Gadol through. You can't get get an LMA through and bag masking with two hands is um, uh, un undo is not doable. Okay. Um, so uh, at this stage, um, I would actually just wait a little bit longer, allowing the propofol concentration to build up. Mm -hmm. um, my next step would be to give some muscle relaxation and my... Yeah, go on. What, uh, so yep, so yep. You, at the point where you're, you've turned up the TIVA, uh, concentration, but the patient starts T saturating because it takes too long uh, to hmm. go in. What do you do then? Okay, so uh, this is a worrying situation. My first thing we'll do is actually temporize the situation, make sure the patient's on 100% oxygen. There is um, some, uh, there's a full seal on the bag mask, and they would administrate rocuronium, and uh, I would be giving this patient uh, 50 milligrams of rocuronium. Okay. You give the 50 milligrams and after about 30 seconds, the patient is able to be ventilated and you put a tube down. Um, now, as you go in to ventilate, the patient looks like it, it, it's very hard to ventilate. So it's a very rock hard um, mm. on, on the bag. What do you do then? Oh, so, sorry, I've got the LMA in or I've got the tube in? Sorry, uh, sorry you put the tube down now. I've got the tube in. Um, so this is a case of high airway pressure. Um, my differential diagnosis, I would go from the patient to the machine. Now, in the context of having uh, rheumatoid arthritis, there's a possibility of having um, pulmonary fibrosis and a restrictive type of lung disease. Uh, there was, in which there was, I, there was no indication of that in your history. They had yeah, no, okay. no, no, nothing to it. It's very mild rheumatoid arthritis from what you saw. Okay. Okay, and then I would have a way listen to the um, chest to look for any sort of signs of bronchospasm, looking very, at the tube. 
It's a very quiet chest. The tube is at 23 centimeters at the lip and you saw it going through the cords. Excellent. Uh, looking for any kinking, whether there's any um, blockage in my HME and then looking right through to the machine to see any, any uh, kinking in the tube and any increase setting on my machine. Nothing there. Next, I would just manually manually feel on the uh, on the bag and just uh, does it feel tight? Have I changed um, turned tight. up the APL valve? APL valve is seventy. It's very tight. Okay. And am I able to bag at all? Am I able to uh, ventilate this patient at all? It's it's very difficult. You seem to be getting little blips of CO two, but minimal volumes with high pressures. What do you do? Okay, so this is a worrying situation. Now, I know that I could bag mask before, and at the moment, I'm no longer able to ventilate the patient. I'm in the blue zone at the moment, so I would actually take the tube out and, uh, and put the Goodell back in and just re-ventilate what I did before with the bag, uh, bag mask unable. ventilation. With the bag mask, you're unable to ventilate with a Goodell in two hands. Okay, so this is an uh, emergency situation at the moment. Um, I would uh, bring the red bell and get some uh, help. And what is my saturation at the moment as well? Look, it's, it was about 95, but it's now dropped to 90. But it's been a bit of time since you were able to get ventilation. Okay. Um, I, so I, I would ask, you know, call the DA at this stage and just yep. to get a bit of additional help just to outline in the, the issue here. That's good. You're in a reasonably small hospital. It's you and your senior registrar. Okay. Um, what do you think is going on? So I've given the muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. I was able to ventilate before. At the moment, I'm no longer able to ventilate. After putting the There's... tube in, you're not able to ventilate. After I put the tube in, so um, could be could be bronchospasm mm -hmm. um, causing it, uh, but usually I would hear a bit of wheeze on that. It's a very quiet chest. Um, could be very severe bronchospasm, I guess. Yeah, what do you want to do to try and rule this out? Um, so I'll give some subutamol, mm -hmm. uh, six to twelve puffs, and see if I can improve the ventilation in this case. Yeah, great. So you, you puff that down and you're able yeah. to now get some resolution. It's still a very, okay. very difficult ventilation, but you're now able to get volumes of 50 mils up to pressures mm -hmm. of 40. So this is still an unideal situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the fact that it's, it's resolved with salbutamol does suggest that maybe there is some involvement with um, bronchospasm. Mm -hmm. um, and but both sides are equal. I've ruled out everything from the tube to the machine, so this is completely a patient. As you start, li as you start listening again, you can hear very, very loud wheezing, very audible wheezing throughout. Okay, all right. So in this case, so yeah, it's um, it's most so my most likely differential diagnosis here is a severe bronchospasm. Um, what I would do is turn up the volatile in this case. I would administer some more ketamine uh, and ask my registrar to draw up some magnesium and I'll give that through. Um, at the same time, I would like to have some backup adrenaline drawn up in the concentration of um, uh, 10 mics per mil and 100 mics per mil. And how this much, may be required later on. How much magnesium would you give and how much adrenaline would you give? So magnesium, I would give 2.47 grams in so one vial, 10 millimoles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, adrenaline, I would titrate it to effect. So mm -hmm. I would, um, you know, this is called more, but gentlemen with significant background of cardiovascular issues. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I would only be giving 10 micrograms at a time and titrating to effect. Now, how do you ventilate this patient? What are your priorities? My priority is oxygenation, uh, ensuring the saturation stays stable uh, and then ventilate ventilate the patient so at, at the moment there is um i would really need to prevent any sort of gas trapping and i would manually ventilate this patient myself um preventing high pressure which cause barrel trauma um so small tidal volume high frequency allowing enough time for expiration what, what frequency did you say uh, uh uh i guess uh low pressure um high enough frequency for gas exchange, but um, allow enough time for uh, expiration. You've stabilized things with repeated ventilin, some adrenaline and magnesium and ketamine and high volatiles. So things look stable, but they're not great. SATs are 
So 89%, 88% on 100% FiO2. Um, and you need to offload some tasks. So you, you program the ventilator. What do you program the ventilator at? Um, so I prevent, uh, program the ventilator into a um, pressure control uh, mode. I would set the peak pressure uh, to 35 centimeters of water. Um, I would turn the IE ratio to one to three. Um, and, and I would see how, how that goes. Yeah. To respirate, what's your PEEP? Uh, my PEEP will be zero. My respirate would be 12. Okay. Now what happens is you see the blood pressure dropping. Uh, what do you do? The blood pressure now drops it to 60. Okay. So this is a um, worrying situation. The, the first thing I would do is temporize that by giving a bit of fluid, uh, 500 mils, 0.5 milligrams of metaraminol. The most likely diagnosis in this case is probably gas trapping, causing decrease in venous return. I would actually just unplug the whole circuit and see if I can push the chest to make sure that there's no gas that's Good. been trapped. What other differential are you thinking about as well? Um, the other differential could be what's happening surgically. Or hopefully the surgery has stopped at this stage. Sorry, surgery I forgot is, to mention. Um, no blood loss there. Um, so decrease in preload. Um, this could be a um, obstructive shock, which is um, a pneumothorax that ha has happened. Um, Anything. Gas trapping. Uh, it could be vasoplegic shock, which is caused by an anaphylaxis of a drug that I've well, given already. How would you rule out anaphylaxis? Because you've got bronchospasm. I, I could look for signs of um, rash, um, drugs that are corporate, usually are antibiotics, um, muscle correct. relaxants. There is no rashes. Um, and once you do disconnect the tube, you see a resolution of this. What do you reprogram the ventilator to? I would increase the IE ratio, have more time for the expiration, and then slow the respiratory rate down further. Give me some numbers. Uh, six and one to three for my IE ratio. Now, when you've got the rest rate on six, uh, you see that you're, you know, you're getting adequate tyler volumes, about 100 to 150 mils. Uh, your pressures are reached. Um, you're still at around 89% oxygen, but you're doing the best you can with that. And the CO2 is climbing to about 100. What do you do? This is, this is worrying. So I need to now increase my respiratory rate uh, and slowly titrate uh, to an extent, to a point where I'm not getting gas trapping and not getting hemodynamic changes as, as a result of that. What, um, what number do you settle on? I would, I would go to eight now. And Let's see if I can get that. And, and, and I would turn the tidal volume up a little bit more. Uh, so at the moment, I'm getting 200 mils. So see if I can increase it to six mils per kg of lean body mass. And uh, that's good. Let's say you go to eight, but you blood, your blood pressure drops again. So then you go back to six respiratory rate and your mm -hmm. CO2 climbs to 110. What do you do? It's tough. Uh, this is <laughs> this is the tough one. Yeah. Um, so just working through the first principle, yep. CO2 is a um, proportional to my VO, VCO2, production of CO2. Now I'm assuming this is uh, stable. Uh, divided by my VA and my alveolar ventilation. My alveolar ventilation is a product of my respiratory rate and tidal volume. And essentially, these are the two things that I'm, mm. I'm trying to weigh up. And one on one end, uh, I'm trying to prevent gas trapping and hemodynamic changes. On the other end, I'm trying to get enough, uh, enough the, ventilation. And there's a classic, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Which one do you prefer to have, CO2 or gas trapping? Uh, I prefer to have CO2. Uh, and what's that called when you allow the CO2 to rise? That's permissive hypercarbia. Perfect. Let's end it there. Fantastic, <laughs> Rao. I gave you such a challenging vibe. We went through so many things there, and I think you tackled it really well. So just, to quickly, just to quickly go through a few of these things. So I like the fact that you went straight to the, you gave a quick summary statement. You didn't elaborate too much, which was great. And you know, you, you, you went to the risk of peripheral stroke and which was um, you know, high in a you know, short time frame, I'd wait six to 12 months and you were able to mention some studies. Interestingly, in my exam, I, I wasn't asked to quote any studies, but this was straight out of a really great BJR article, which talks about a, a lot of these factors and combines lots of studies. So it was great that you 
had, had knowledge of those already. So I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah, there's like a 68 fold increased risk of stroke if you go within 30 days versus nine months. So right. it, it, I, I, again, yeah, the old, the old, the old thoughts were three, you know, within three months, maybe six months is fine, but it's that one Danish study shows that there's, you know, up, up to nine months is potentially what you need for elective strokes. When I, when I narrowed down to the detail on that particular study, it looked like it wasn't that much less than six months. So I'm not sure how they picked the cutoff for that, but that's something that the, um, you know, we can have a look at and the audience can have a look at. Uh, we talked about the risk factors, uh, go broad, surgical factors, patient factors, anesthetic factors. Specifically, I can talk about Chad Vask and particular surgeries like carotid endarthrectomy, which is good. You delayed the surgery, which is, I think, the correct thing to do, in my opinion, and, and of this guideline. And then you then didn't want to bridge the warfarin, which is absolutely fine. Look, you know, you know even when the Chad Vask is very high, did the bridge trial comment that you actually don't need to depend on Chad Vask to decide bridging or not? Um, actually, sorry, the, the, the bridge trial, uh, it's actually the recommendation based on the up-to-date article. So I don't think the bridge trial specifically, actually, you're right, I recommend that, but there's an up-to-date article that specifically addresses that, and there's a table, yes. and I think from memory, they classify 789 as the high risk, and they recommend in that particular group, hmm. you should bridge. Um, and, and it's good to be able to quote that because... I think local guidelines that I've seen, so my own local guidelines, do not take into account Chad Basque as a perioperative decision tool for bridging. So mm. for, for us, it's potentially you bridge if it's a high risk, you know, warfarin situation like me mechanical valves, recent yeah. um, and you know, recent PEs and other others, yes, others yeah. and, and congenital issues. But Chad Basque has no bearing on it. But if you can quote something, you know, there's a lot of variance in this. I think it's a, it's not a great evidence zone. Um, you knew about Hasbled, which is great. Aspirin, you were able to, you know, quote, uh, quote the um, uh, right pulse in that, and you didn't start the beta blocker because poise one, you know, that's not something you need to. And that, and, and I think that's pretty good level one, you know, one A evidence or something along the pretty good, pretty good evidence for that. Uh, the type of anesthesia doesn't affect stroke, so you're happy to go with a with a um, spinal. And then the rest of it, I was just riffing really. I was just I was just seeing where it goes. So we had a situation where again the spinal's wearing off, and you very quickly offered the general anesthetic. So I think that's good. You know, depending on the part of the surgery, stop the surgery. If we're well into it, then you've got to offer a GA, or this is terrible for the patient. If they're on the skin layers, I think we both know we can probably get them through with a bit of informed consent, local anesthetic, fentanyl nitrous stuff like that. Uh, and then we got into the situation. Now, so now it, crises are always really annoying because you're not you're not right there, and it's very difficult to see exactly what's going on. I thought I thought you handled it really well. Um, your systems were really good. So you know you first quickly went progressed from a LMA, which was kind of stuffed up by the, the registrar's intervention. You quickly went to profile and then rock your aim to solve that problem, uh, which I think you know everyone has had to do in their careers. Put the tube down, and suddenly you had a rock hard, um, you know, uh, ventilation uh, with 70 of pressure on the valve. It was really reasonable that you would take the tube out just in case it's the wrong wrong position. I think these days, I if I've seen the tube and I've got a silent chest and rock hard, there's nowhere else it can be but bronchospasm. Mm -hmm. Esophageal intubation is a collapse outside of the lungs is a collapse, and there's very little that it can abut against except bronchospasms that's severe or a kink in the tube, mm -hmm. which I can, I, can, I can observe. So I would go straight from that point to, uh, I personally probably would just go straight to, this is severe bronchospasm, call for help, ventilin, yeah. administer, followed up with atrovent, magnesium, and adrenaline IV, exactly at the doses you, you talked about, which is really great. So the way you went through that by saying a plan and doses is really great. So I always talk about talking about the full story because it's easier to tell your examiners this severe bronchospasm, I would, you know, optimize the ventilation, high, 100 percent oxygen, bagging manually, slowly, and give regular nebs through the circuit or vent, ventilin MDI through the circuit, followed up with magnesium and atrovent and ketamine and turn up the volatiles and, you know, adrenaline 10 mic boluses uh, for to try and get to a resolution. That way, I've set a complete answer and they can tease the part they need to. So that's my strategy. I talk fast. I get through a lot of stuff uh, because I've got those algorithms. And then the next thing we went on to is the tricky aspect of ventilation. So you, I love the fact that you said my priorities are oxygenation, avoid uh, gas trapping and barotrauma. And the one thing I would have added then is also permissive hypercapnia. Mm -hmm. So 
100% oxygen oxygenation. I just need that to be good. Permissive hypercapnia. I care less about the CO2 rising short term because that's a treatable thing. Um, respiratory acidosis is not as bad as metabolic acidosis, for example. In this context, you know, trying to get the CO2 down, mm -hmm. which was kind of what was happening temporarily, will cause gas trapping, which then causes an arrest. So, you know, uh, again, your ventilator settings were pretty reasonable because you said, you know, 100% oxygen, uh, you targeted a pressure, was when your pressure is your limiting variable, that will give you the best volume per pressure unit. Therefore, that's great. Um, I, I would have done just straight off to a slow respiratory rate, knowing that gas trapping is a problem, uh, and then gone low and then slowly increase rather than high and then go down. Mm -hmm. Personally, yes. that's what I've done. I, I talk less about IE ratios because if you have an IE ratio of one to four at a respiratory rate of 12, that still yeah. is a shorter expiration time than a respiratory rate of four with an IE ratio of one to two. So mm -hmm. that, that's one of those things that doesn't really matter what the IE ratio is, the absolute time is more important. And so that's why I just go straight to four or six or you know something low. Uh, and then we got to that kind of conflicting problems thing, but then you very correctly said, yeah, look, uh, I'd wear the CO2, permissive hypercapnia, that's fine. Um, that was great. Uh, any questions? <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a, it was a tough barber, but yeah, thank you so much. Makes it makes it stronger, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's it's uh, trust me, it's so much easier being the person asking the question. So uh, <laughs> I, I just, yeah, you did really well. <laughs> good. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, well, well, hey, all the best, and you know, good luck. I'm sure you'll do really well, and hopefully, you know. On the other side of this, I'll, I'll be over in New Zealand celebrating with you guys at some stage once lockdowns and COVID is pretty much over. So Looking forward to it, eh? No, seriously looking forward to it. If you ever come to New Zealand, let us know. Oh, I would yeah. love to have you here. Which, which, which city are you in? Wellington. Oh, I haven't been to Wellington. I will definitely yeah. come visit Wellington. Uh, that sounds yeah. great. <laughs> awesome. Hit me up. Sounds good, right? I'll see you soon. All the best. Cool. Thanks, Leo. So that was another episode. Thanks so much for watching and listening. Uh, please share with anyone if you think this is relevant for them. Um, and yeah, for everyone seeing their exam soon, really good luck, all the best, and uh, see you on the other side. Thanks a lot. Bye.